before working at uh, his own indie studio, was an executive producer at Booya and a senior producer at Glue, as well as a studio GM in the River Sorter. He's made a lot of awesome games. Um, his newest title is Hovercraft. It's uh, recently hit three million downloads. If you have mobile phones, I'm not sure how many of you do smartphones, you can go on right now and download that. Uh, it's a pretty awesome game. It's a really nifty mashup between kind of like a crafting mechanic, as well as like an endless racer, endless runner. Um, perhaps you could tell me a little bit a little bit more about that. I've been making mobile games for a long time. Uh, it started in, in 2005 at Glue Mobile. And uh, you know, back then it was kind of the feature phone days and, and I was working with a lot of great people at Glue and we kind of started the initiative at Glue to make freemium games. And uh, the first one that I worked on there was kind of Glue's foray into free to play games, which is Gun Bros. And my partner Noah, actually that's where we met. The two of us worked together on Gun Bros uh, for well over a year, maybe close to two years doing updates. And then, um, yeah, from there we went, I went to a company called Booyah. Uh, we made a bunch of you know, great little mobile games that were sim-based. So we made uh, My Town 2, uh, No Zombies Allowed. And then um, while I was at Booyah for a year, I had been kind of um, planting the seed in, in, in Noah to quit his job and try our own thing together. And after, after a year, he finally agreed and we both quit our jobs and started our own thing, which was terrifying. Yeah. And, and if you had to pick one thing that you would say you learned uh, working at some of those uh, larger studios, um, what's you know, one kernel of, of truth that you were able to glean? Um, I think the most important thing is really that you need, I mean, it's, it's, it's imperative to make a really fun gaming experience. I think that's probably the most important thing, especially for people that are passionate about playing video games or making mobile games. Um, there's a lot of great content out on the store and um, you know, there's, there's some great games that don't get seen, there's not great games that do get seen, but at the end of the day, I think the, thing that, the only thing that we can do as developers is make stuff that we're passionate about and, and make it as, as best as we can. Can you tell me a little bit about your first game? Because Hovercraft isn't your first, it's your, your second with High Score Hero. Um, let's hear about the, the first one. What worked, what didn't? Yeah, so we started High Score Hero in, in 2013, so it's relatively new. And the first game that we made was called Canyon Crashers. It's, it's out on the App Store, it's still there. Um, and for all intents and purposes, it was, it was a pretty big failure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And, but, but it was a passion project for us. Like My partner and I, Noah, we, we loved that game. And to this day, whenever we think about it or look at it, we're, we're, we're always just like, oh, what went wrong? Like We loved that game. It, it was our baby. Um, we worked on that game for just over a year. So we spent a good amount of time and a good amount of money working on that game. We, we, um, although we did most of the development ourselves, because it's just the two of us, we contracted out some of the art. It's a full 3D puzzle game. Um, we made sure that with that game, we, we told ourselves we're going to launch this game with feature parity. It's going to be, you know, right up there with Subway Surfers and it's going to be awesome. And yeah, I mean, we were kind of just trying to pump ourselves up. But I think the biggest lesson that we learned with that game was that we took too long. We took too long and we spent way too much money. How long did you take? Uh, just over a year. Just okay. over a year. Yeah. yeah. And we, you know, when we started High Score here, we didn't do any fundraising or anything like that. We were literally living off of our, our savings accounts. And uh, we were so enthralled with the idea of this game, and we, we kind of fell in love with it too much. And, you know, we, we, like I said, we spent way too much time and way too much money. And um, we released it, and it, it got featuring. Um, you know, our first week was great. I think we had just over 750,000 downloads the first week, uh, mainly because we got featured. Um, but then after that, it kind of just fell off like a rock. Um, and we're still really proud of what we did with that game, but you know, we, we took some huge lessons from that and applied it to, to our next game. Um, and I'm curious, I'm sure for a lot of people who are at indie studios or considering making the jump and they have a lot of game ideas, uh, you know, thinking about anything from like the next uh, RPG casino mashup to, um, you know, perhaps like a Clash of Clans similar type, type title and they're weighing which, uh, uh, which game to make. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your, um, uh, your development strategy, like how you decide which games you're going to make and, and then how you go about executing on that. Right, right. Um, a lot of it has to do with brainstorming and iteration. Um, m my buddy Noah and I, you know, we spend a lot of time just talking about games, not only mobile games, but console games, PC games. We play 
way too many games. Um, we probably should do that a That's little less and make, make more. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but it's it's really it's really a passion for us. So you know we play everything that's out there, and and unfortunately for our situation, a lot of it is really limited based on on the resources we have. Right? It's literally just the two of us. And one of the goals that we wanted to keep uh, in hand when we started this company was to stay as light and as lean as possible. So you know we never really considered hiring on more help. Maybe that's something that we can do in the future, but with these two games, it was, what can we do with the resources that we have? So, you know, we use uh, game engines, we use uh, third-party tools to kind of get the most out of, out of the, two, the two of us. And a lot of it is really around, since we use a game engine that we can iterate on very quickly, mm -hmm. let's just brainstorm ideas and actually prototype them fast. Um, so that's something that we've gotten pretty good at. Um, with, with the first game with Canyon Crashers, that's a, it's like a match three puzzle game mixed with a runner, and it sounds kind of weird. But um, that game started out as a different game, and Hovercraft actually started out as a creature battle game that turned into a 3D puzzle game that turned into a racing game. <laughs> so it's, it's really strange, it doesn't make any sense, but since we were able to iterate so fast and, and you know, share what we've done with our friends and our family, and you know, we're very fortunate to have a lot of friends um, in the mobile gaming industry and in the, in the gaming industry in general. So, you know, we just, we whip out a lot of prototypes, we brainstorm ideas and say, oh, that's cool, let's try that. And then it's either fun or it's not. And if we think we have something, um, we kind of just roll with it. Um, and with your first title, you mentioned that taking too long was a, a big mistake that you had made. Would you say that's the biggest you've done uh, in terms of mistakes? I, I think, you know, to some degree, it's a little easier to learn from what yeah. doesn't work than uh, necessarily from what does. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I think it's kind of half of the, the the big mistakes that we made was taking too long, taking too long and spending too much. Mm. Um, the other half, I honestly don't know what, <laughs> what it was. Um, that game, like I said, it was our baby and it, and it didn't do so well at the end of the day, but we're really proud of it. So a lot of it is kind of, you know, did we make the game too hard? Did we, you know, not hit the right demo? Um, did we, was the tuning not correct? So. It's, it's hard to say exactly what went wrong with that mm. game, and, and I actually wish for myself that, that I had better answers, but unfortunately I don't. But mm. the big takeaway is, yeah, like we, we wanted to make a game, we, we want to make games now fast. We want to make them fast, we want to iterate on them quickly. Mm. And outside of the design and maybe some of the um, production strategies, do you feel like uh, there were major lessons learned in terms of the marketing or the monetization side? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the one of the big things that we actually learned with um, with hovercraft and you know learnings from Canyon Crashers was, and this might sound kind of interesting, but like we we make casual games. So there's a lot of great mobile games out there that are more RPG oriented or mid core oriented. But the games that we make are super casual. We want them to be accessible to as broad an audience as possible. Um, and one of the surprising regrets that we actually had about hovercraft, which is our latest game, was that we didn't launch with interstitial ads. Um, this, it's kind of interesting considering where we are and it might sound like pandering, but it's, it's really not. Um, we actually, <laughs> uh, we, had, we, had a great, we had a great start because we got featured um, by Apple, fortunately, and by Google. Um, and one of the things that we said to ourselves was, let's hold back on some of the advertisements or some of the things that might detract or take away from the pure gameplay experience. And, uh, and we did that and we launched and the launch was great, the retention was great. Um, and then, you know, a little bit further down the line, we said, you know, let's test, let's test some ads, let's test um, how users would react to this and whether it affects our retention or whether it affects our reviews. And once we turned, once we turned them on, literally almost no, no effect. Um, so, you know, looking back, um, it's definitely not all about the money, but we did leave a lot of money on the table. Um, so that's, that's one of the interesting um, kind of looking back things that we think about. Yeah, um, and speaking of retention, um, for those who are just getting introduced to the world of analytics, uh, what would you say are the most important metrics to you? Um, definitely the most important me metric is retention. I mean, that's yeah. quite literally with Hovercraft, that is almost the only metric that we look at. Um, with Canyon Crashers, we spent a lot of time and, and worked really hard on putting a lot of analytic hooks into the game. 
We've, we had hundreds of analytic hooks in that game. We knew what everybody was doing, what buttons they were pressing, where they were going, what they were buying, what they were not buying. And at the end of the day, it turned into a lot of noise and distraction for us. Um, you know, because, especially because there's only two of us and there's only so much we could do. So we really had to strictly prioritize what are the things that we're gonna um, focus on and what are the metrics that we're gonna need to say are the top priority. And it always came back to retention because you could have the best monetizing game in the world, but if people aren't coming back to it regularly, it's probably not gonna work out. So, so with Hovercraft, Retention is retention, came. and and do you have targets for D one, D seven retention? Yeah, I mean, I, ideally, I think if we can if we can hold a, a forty plus percent D one retention, yeah. um, then I think we're in a good place. With casual games, it's a little it's a little trickier because if you have a, a strongly engaging game that's a mid core game or an RPG, you know, if you can if you can hold ten percent or fifteen percent of your users after a month, you're doing pretty well. Um, with casual games, I think the trend is that they drop off a lot faster. So our, our short-term retention is really strong. Um, we're still currently around 45 to 50% D1 retention, which is, yeah, I mean, we're, we're really lucky that, that people enjoy our game. Um, so we're continuing to see how we can, how we can improve that and, and, and longer-term retention as well. Cool. Uh, and I'm just going to shake, shake things up a little bit again. OK, so of the people who are with a, um, a developer, making games. Uh, can I see a show of hands if you're at uh, an indie developer? We'll, we'll say maybe smaller than 10 folks. 10, OK, one, two, three, two, three, three. OK. And then I guess the rest of you at uh, mid-size or triple A's? Cool. All right, awesome. Um, so for the indie, indie folks in the audience, um, do you have uh, tips on user acquisition for newbies or just people with small budgets? Sure, yeah. That was, that was probably one of the, the hardest and most um, complicated things for us because, because we started the company and we're, you know, we're bootstrapped the whole way. We didn't have any budget for UA, really. Um, we did some small tests here and there, but what worked for us in particular was really kind of doing more grassroots things. And I know it's, it's kind of um, contradictory because like a lot of, you know, I've worked at bigger developers too and at bigger developers, Obviously, there's people that are dedicated to doing those types of things, but the ROI is usually pretty low on those, um, whether you get press coverage, whether you get um, blog coverage. Like, that stuff is all great, and it always helps, um, but there's a lot of effort that goes into that. Um, with our titles, since we didn't have the money to spend, we really needed to spend a lot of time doing more kind of manual getting the word out there. Um, one huge thing for us was YouTube. Um, that's something that was actually that was actually not discussed much, if at all, at the bigger companies that I worked with. But mm. YouTube gaming, um, YouTube celebrities that cover games, mobile games, console games, they have a tremendous amount of followers, tremendous amount of views. And if you get picked up by a popular YouTuber and they show your game to their following, um, it'll be a tremendous bump. So I would literally, you know, spend hours and days and weeks, literally just scavenging YouTube looking for contact emails for guys that you know, have a decent following, even guys that have small followings, guys or gals that have small followings. But I just made massive, massive lists of you know, game reviewers, blogs, websites, and then I spent a tremendous amount of time on YouTube um, watching videos, seeing, um, seeing who covers mobile games, freemium games, and I reached out to all of them and, and made each email as, personable, as, as personal as I could. Um, and I think in the long run, it really paid off. Um, one, of the, one YouTuber covered us. Uh, he does these family, family uh, videos with his two little kids and his wife, and they play games together. And uh, he did two videos on us, on Hovercraft in particular. And I think each of those videos had just under a million views. Um, and we had, we had a huge spike that weekend that kind of um, kept, kept, us, kept us strong for, for some time. Interesting. And uh, approximately, um, what is the ratio of the number of people you reach out to, uh, to the number that actually responded and did a, a video on your game? It's, it's insanely low. <laughs> um, that shouldn't be, that's probably not a surprise to anybody here. But uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's catastrophically low. But it's something that's necessary. I mean, if you, if you really want your game to be as successful as it could be, I think that you have to put that work into it. So now, you know, we're, we're working on another game now, and, and 
you know, with the first game with Canyon Crashers, we didn't put much time into it. Like I knew I had a list of, you know, the, the big reviewers and the big sites and I sent them emails, but that, that worked out for nothing. Like that got, that got nowhere, unfortunately. So with the second game, I said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into other avenues. You know, like I said, YouTube was a big one. Um, and then the, the next game that we're going to work on, I'm going to do the same thing, allocate a lot of time to, you know, talking with YouTubers, um, talking with bloggers, and, you know, sharing my game with them, trying to, trying to get their feedback and opinions, which is a great thing. Also, previews are huge. Um, I think a lot of developers work so hard on their game, and then they just kind of put it out there and hope that, people will cover it or people will you know, check it out or put it on YouTube or whatever. But um, I think part of it now is really about sharing with the community prior to launch and really saying, this is what I'm working on. I would love your feedback. I would love to get involved with um, different forums, um, communities that play mobile games and, uh, and take advantage of all that stuff because there's a lot of great people and a lot of great information out there. Uh, and you also told me earlier that you did some testing with Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we did, we did some small testing with Facebook. Um, we, spent, we spent a couple of grand here and there with Facebook. Facebook's actually really, um, if you have the money and you know precisely what your demo is, Facebook is a great user acquisition tool if you can afford it and if your game monetizes well enough to justify the cost. Um, I've actually, I've worked with a lot of different advertising companies, um, whether it be at High Score Hero or previous companies. And, uh, and obviously, you know, Facebook just has such a huge audience and their targeting capabilities are mm -hmm. ridiculous. They're awesome, actually. Um, so it was, it was successful in terms of being able to target exactly who we wanted and doing it for a relatively low CPI. Um, but for our game, which is a really casual game, it's not, it didn't make sense for us because our game's not really a high IAP monetizing game. It's, it's much more of a um, ad revenue driven game that we want to keep people in and playing on a regular basis um, rather than saying, you know, everybody's going to spend $5 who plays a game because that's, that's generally not the case with the super casual games. Um, but Facebook, Facebook was a good, it was a good um, experiment into, into, you know, how they can target, how mm -hmm. they deliver installs. And if we make a game that is more appropriate for spending in that way, mm -hmm. um, it would be a good outlet. Cool. Um, so I, I saw a few phones out, uh, which means inevitably some people are playing uh, the hovercraft. But for those who aren't, um, there's a, I, I want to explain a piece of the game f before the next question. Um, so in the game, uh, part of the mechanic is that you're crafting hovercraft um, in sort of like a blocky, blocky kind of Minecraft style, um, which means that you can basically make any, any of the hovercraft you want, right? Yeah. Uh, but you also monetize in the game by selling custom built, or I guess like a, a maybe more formally built uh, a hovercraft. So I'm curious, from a user's perspective uh, and from your sort of monetization thoughts, like if I can make any of the hovercraft, why would I buy them? Right. Right. That's a, it's a really good question, and it's a question that we asked ourselves. Like, wh why would you do this? You can. From the get-go in the game, you can build whatever you want. We kind of give you these, these tools to make any type of hovercraft you want. And then we sell pre-made hovercrafts uh, as well, as well as give them away as prizes for coming back to the game. Um, but the answer, the conclusion that we came to was basically that it's, it's pretty common within free-to-play games that, you, that certain users would spend money to bypass time or to bypass effort. And that's, that's the answer that we came up with. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time making hovercrafts that we thought would look really cool. And to make those, uh, although we, we made the tools as easy as possible for people to use, it still takes a fair amount of creativity or a fair amount of effort to place each individual block. You can place up to 400 blocks. Um, you know, it takes time and effort and creativity to be able to do that. And for those that um, don't want to spend that time or don't, you know, are not, um, super creative or don't want to be, they can. They have the option of just winning them um, using in-game currency, or they can just buy them as well. Cool. So since you have all these people that are making uh, their own hovercraft, is community management an important part of, of this game? It, it is and it isn't. Um, one of the things that we didn't get to um, for hovercraft was for oh. users to be able to share models. That's something that we're really um, excited about doing with either Hovercraft or, or something similar with, a, with another title. Um, 
So there's no, there's no kind of community sharing of models, which hopefully there will be soon, but um, that aside, I think community is very important because hovercraft in particular was really popular with um, middle school kids. And, and the reason why I say community was important was because I tried to make sure to take the time to answer each email and each question very personally and very individually. And I think, I think in the long run, and granted it's super time consuming to do that kind of thing, but in the long run I think it paid off because I really believe that a lot of Hovercraft's you know, success was due to these kids playing them together. And I would get so many emails, they were the best emails to read ever, where this kid's basically just like, hey, everybody at lunch is playing, playing this game and I love it so much, please support my device that we don't support, which is heartbreaking. Um, but, you know, I would get those emails all the time. They're like, oh, my friends at school showed me this and, um, you know, I have some great game ideas for you. And I would respond to everyone and be like, those are awesome game ideas. We actually have them in our feature list and we're going to, you know, keep an eye out for them. Um, but I, I truly believe that interacting with your community, interacting with your with the people that are playing your games, especially the ones that are so excited about it that they're actually going to send you a, an email, I think it's worthwhile to to write back to them and let let them know that you know that you're listening, that you care about what they say. Cool. Um, and my my final question before we turn this over to the audience. Um, earlier on the phone, you used the phrase "hooks become noise." Um, can you expand on that? Yeah. This this situation was it was probably more apropos to, to our company and what we were doing. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, kind of managing and analyzing data is super important. Um, at, you know, at companies like Booyah, we were a very data-driven company. We were design-driven also, but we were hyper data-driven. Um, with a small company and with limited resources, there's only so much you can do with data and there's only so much time you can spend on it. Um, so I kind of touched on this earlier, but with Canyon Crashers, we had so much data that you know, we would spend so much time looking at all these graphs and trying to crunch numbers and build you know, charts that we just ended up spending a lot of time doing it and not coming up with super actionable stuff in a timely manner. Um, so the reason I say that for, for our situation in particular, too much data became very noisy and it became very distracting. Um, which is why for Hovercraft, we kind of focused, um, we, we really pinpointed on retention. Like that's the only thing that matters to us. We want people to play our game and we want them to come back regularly. Um, and then the money and all that stuff will come if we do a good job doing that. So that was the hope. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so we have, uh, we have some time uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, and I see hands, so we'll start over here. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question because obviously, as, as most of you probably know, Apple can make or break your game if they feature or if they don't feature. Same with Google, same with Amazon. Um, I had been making mobile games for a long time, so I'd, I'd actually been in the very fortunate position of having a contact at Apple. But um, um, after Canyon Crashers launched, my, ca my contact actually left. So I lost my contact at Apple for Hovercraft. Um, from there, it was really a mad dash to find a contact beg, borrow, or steal, talk to anybody you know and say, I need to talk to somebody there because you need to talk to somebody there. Um, you need to get your game in front of them no matter the cost. That's probably the most important thing that you can do. There's a lot of great resources online about the things that you can do to get noticed by Apple and I think those are all appropriate and, and very important. Um, but if you have friends in the industry or if you have um, other contacts at Apple or in tech, I think doing whatever you can to try to get a direct contact and to get a direct communication line with them um, is, is super important. We spent just over a year with Canyon Crashers and then with Hovercraft we said we're not going to spend any money and we're going to make this thing as fast as possible. So we literally spent zero dollars making Hovercraft and we made it, uh, we did some iterating um, with prototypes and like I said, it started out as a monster battle game and it went to a puzzle game. But once we started working on Hovercraft itself, we built it in about three and a half months. That's a really good question and I, I think there's a million features out there that people try to do to retain users, whether it's you know, a, a lottery spin every, every day or a daily bonus. Um, I think those things are all important. Um, I think the most important thing is to give, to give users a, a reason to come back to your game that is not going to end up 
costing them something. Um, I, I truly believe that people, that users appreciate that kind of thing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of games out there that kind of monetize you really hard. And those, those games are important, and I enjoy those games as much as the next guy. But I think with smaller companies, with you know, indie devs, guys that are just working on stuff that they're passionate about, they really just got to try to get people to play the game first. Um, and you know, that's, that's something that, that we continue to struggle with, just like everybody else, I think. Um, but it's really about offering them good content and doling it out in the way that makes sense for the tuning of the game. You know, here's a new hovercraft every six hours, or your first new hovercraft you get in 15 minutes, and the next one's 45 minutes. Um, and then if you come back the next day, you'll have access to even better hovercrafts. Um, things like that, I think, giving people content, exciting content, um, without having to have them pay for it or take some sort of um, game risk or, or financial um, take to, to, get, to get something cool. Since I, since I had actually ended up getting a contact at, at Apple, we had, a, we had a roadmap with them. So they knew exactly when we were going to launch the game, and, and we had that set up um, about a month beforehand. Um, so we, we made sure that timing, timing is really critical in the App Store, too. You want to make sure that you know, there's a million reasons why your app can fail submission. And if you fail submission at the wrong time and you're not ready for your launch, you know, that's catastrophic. Um, so it's really about testing the game, making sure that you have a launch date, that people know about it, whether it be Apple, Google, or you know, even forums or, or people in press. Um, and then planning around that. So we make sure that our game is approved and ready to go live weeks before our, uh, our launch date. And then um, once it's approved, it, all it takes is a flip of a switch to, to dole it out to everybody. Um, and then once we launch, we launch, most games usually launch on Thursday or Wednesday evening on the App Store because Thursday is when the, the featuring gets refreshed and that's when Apple likes to feature new, new content. Um, so we usually launch Wednesday, um, Wednesday evening and then um, you know, send out emails, contact. We, we contact press beforehand too, but we send them um, press as well as YouTubers. You know, our game is live, here's a direct link, check it out. Um, there's a lot of pre-work up to that to make sure that they get, can get their hands on it earlier, um, but, but launch is kind of the reminder, oh, it's live now, everybody has access to it. For Hovercraft, to be, <laughs> to be honest with you, retention is, that's it. Like that's, that's all we look at. Every now and then we'll look at the monetization of the game and see how hovercrafts are selling. But when we built hovercraft, we knew that it wasn't going to be a highly monetizing IAP game. We knew that we wanted to keep people engaged in the game and, and if we succeed at that, then we'll make enough on, on ads to kind of keep us going. Um, so, so there wasn't, to be quite honest, there wasn't a lot of super focus on, on other analytics. It was really, let's get people in the game and let's keep them coming back. Um, one of the other things that we do look at every now and then is how many sessions people are playing and what the session length is. Because um, in my opinion, that's all tied into retention. If people are coming back every day, that's great. But if they're playing for longer sessions or more sessions per day, you're doing something right. Um, so that's, those are the three things that we really look at, especially when we put out updates. Um, we put out updates to, to try to hit specific uh, metrics, say, well, every update we do is actually just retention-based, but you know, once we put out an update, it's has the retention been steady, going up or going down? What do the session links look like? Are people playing more, are they playing less? Um, and how often are they playing per day? To be quite honest with you, our, our business isn't super big. I mean, relatively speaking, we're still very small and, and we're still you know, we're very lucky that we're able to do what we do. But our, our games, both of them actually, Canyon Crashers and Hovercraft, were actually pretty big in China and in South Korea, as well as Japan, actually. Um, one of the things that we think about often when we're building our game is how do we make it accessible to the widest audience possible? Um, it's kind of contrary to what a lot of people do when they build games, um, but I think, um, for us at least, with casual games, we said, we don't want to try to hit a very specific demo, so we're not only looking at US or, or middle school kids. We want to make it as broad as possible. We just kind of want to get it out there and say whether you're 12 years old or 40 years old, you can play our game and enjoy it. 
Um, and Asia, you know, looking at the Asian cultures or the Asian markets in particular was, was something that we did a lot of because um, when Canyon Crashers launched, we, was, we were featured in China with a main banner, which was, which was great and we were very lucky for that. And when Hovercraft launched, we were featured with a banner in South Korea. And we had a lot of um, great feedback from people in, in, in Asian countries in particular. And uh, I loved getting the feedback and seeing, seeing what they say. And uh, we tried to, to make content that they would enjoy too, whether it's, you know, in, in Canyon Crashers, there's like Asian themed carts. We experimented with all different types of things um, and with hovercraft as well, you know, making hovercrafts that might appeal. But we weren't super analytical about it. So a lot of it was just kind of like, oh, maybe they'll like that. And, We'll just put it out there, um, uh, but it, 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 the Asian the Asian markets are something that we watch very closely because the Chinese market is huge. It's really, you know, it's it's if you can do well in China, then you're good. Um, so it's definitely an important step, I think, to think about not only will Americans or North Americans enjoy my game, but how will people react to it in, in Asia? Asia is a huge market that shouldn't be that shouldn't be um, dismissed. So the name of the game is Hovercraft. It's available now uh, globally. Uh, go out, download it. Uh, I want to give a huge round of applause to Spark for coming out nice. and sharing his insights, and also for you guys for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.